colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As uh, Manfred kindly introduced, uh, my name is Sabi Peter. I work as a scientist and a clinical trial manager at uh, DSM in uh, Switzerland. And uh, today I would like to talk about uh, vitamin E, which is not only my uh, expert field, but it's uh, also my, my favorite topic. Um, I am uh, uh, hoping that uh, at the end of the pre my presentation you will uh, get also my enthusiasm into, uh, of this uh, uh, research, what I, I am doing or we are doing uh, together with, uh, with our team at uh, DSM regarding vitamin E. So <clears throat> um, I will be summarizing uh, what is known about vitamin E today, what is the function, the basic function of vitamin E, and what, what is the new science, what is the, the newest science um, which um, uh, regards to vitamin E. My first slide, uh, it's about um, nutrient requirements and um, the corresponding recommended uh, dietary intakes in general. This is not only on vitamin E, this is, this is in general. So <clears throat> um, uh, this first graph shows that uh, um, uh, the average requirement for any uh, micronutrient or vitamin is defined as the requirement of the 50% of the total population. Uh, this is called uh, average requirement or estimated average requirement, while um, <clears throat> um, there is another uh, measure called population reference intake, which corresponds to, to the needs of 97% uh, of the world population. So <clears throat> based on these requirements, there are some recommended intakes uh, as defined by different organizations. These reference intakes are science-based, are depending obviously on the existing uh, and available data. They are very much country or institution specific. For example, the German speaking countries in uh, Europe have their own reference uh, intake values or the WHO or uh, um, the Institutes of Medicine in the United States. Uh, they are sometimes politically driven <clears throat> and uh, reflect very much uh, different eating uh, cultures. So all these, uh, these uh, uh, cutoff points, the EARs and RDAs, are not uh, um, ubiquitous, so to say. They are not the same in uh, every country and region. They might be different. And now <clears throat> um, to the topic of vitamin E. What is vitamin E? Basically, vitamin E is a fat-soluble um, molecule but not only one molecule. It is a generic term for eight different forms, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta tocopherol, and the corresponding tocotrienols. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I do not want to go very much into details. Here you can see the different uh, uh, forms of uh, tocopherols and tocotrienols. Vitamin E is uh, naturally produced uh, in plants only, and uh, the relative uh, ratio of tocopherols and tocotrienols varies <coughs> uh, largely among the uh, different forms of plants. But alpha tocopherol has a very specific uh, uh, position here because uh, this is the form which is um, the most maintained uh, in the human body, and therefore all the recommendations uh, based on the nutritional intake or uh, plasma levels are based on, uh, on the alpha tocopherol. Okay, so what is the, the function of uh, vitamin E? What is uh, known uh, for, for quite a long time uh, is that vitamin E is a powerful antioxidant. Uh, if it's oxidized, it can be uh, regenerated by vitamin C. So they are working, working together. And uh, due to its lipophilic uh, nature, vitamin E localizes in uh, uh, cellular membranes where it has the function to uh, pro, uh, to prevent peroxidation of lipids and oxidation of membrane proteins. <clears throat> um, furthermore, there have been some uh, exper uh, experiments performed showing um, a role in uh, signal trans uh, transduction modulation and also uh, the modulation of gene expression for vitamin E. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> um, EFSA in 2011 acknowledged this uh, essential role of uh, um, vitamin E as being an antioxidant uh, with a health claim saying that vitamin E contributes to the protection of cells from oxidative stress. So this is already a quite strong uh, um, established uh, function for vitamin E. <clears throat> Speaking uh, um, about the um, recommended daily allowances which I was uh, uh, talking about uh, on my first slide. Uh, for RDAs, currently, they are basically 
uh, established on the basis of uh, hemolysis, red blood cell uh, hemolysis, and also the PUFA intake. So <clears throat> what does it mean? Uh, if uh, somebody does not have enough vitamin E uh, in, in the plasma, then uh, the red blood cells uh, tend to, uh, to hemolyze, to, uh, to explode, so to say. Uh, so it means that uh, if, uh, <clears throat> if a, a threshold level of 12 micromore per liter is not achieved uh, in the human plasma, then there is an increased risk of, uh, of hemolysis. Um, again, um, these uh, experiments uh, have been performed back in the 70s. They are uh, quite all the data and uh, not uh, always reliable. However, all the, uh, all the RDAs are based uh, currently on this uh, um, on these data. So the EAR, the average, uh, the estimated average requirement is based on this uh, uh, threshold level, uh, saying that uh, 12 milligram vitamin E is the needed intake to meet this uh, requirement of uh, EAR, and 50 milligram is established uh, as uh, sufficient for <clears throat> the 97% uh, of the population on a daily basis. Um, I also mentioned the PUFA intake. Uh, of course, if you eat more PUFA, if the PUFA intake is it's, uh, increased, then you would need logically more vitamin E in order to protect uh, the peroxidation of these uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So it means that uh, this RDA is not uh, sufficient in uh, all cases uh, in order to protect from this uh, uh, PUFA peroxidation. So uh, this requirement may vary um, between the 15 and uh, 25 uh, milligrams per day or even higher if the PUFA intake uh, is uh, uh, increased. So <clears throat> this is uh, regarding the RDAs, but uh, a higher intake of uh, vitamin E beyond this nutritional requirement may provide additional benefits uh, in defined uh, population groups. And this is the, uh, where the excitement begins because uh, here we have some new uh, data to share and um, as you will see, the science is really, really uh, booming here. Uh, but let's jump into the middle. Um, I will mention three diseases, three conditions. The first one is uh, diabetes. <clears throat> this is a general slide showing the uh, the prevalence of diabetes, uh, which is uh, uh, enormous, especially in the southeastern uh, Asia region, you can see how many people suffer currently uh, of, uh, uh, of diabetes, and almost half of them are undiagnosed, undiagnosed uh, uh, diabetes cases. So currently, almost uh, 400 million people worldwide uh, suffer from this uh, severe uh, condition, and it is estimated that by 2035, it will be almost 600 million people worldwide affected by diabetes. Uh, and now vitamin E comes into the picture. Uh, first, with uh, some epidemiological studies showing that uh, uh, their vitamin E could have a role to play here. <clears throat> so um, some studies uh, uh, demonstrated that lower plasma level of vitamin E uh, was identified in type 2 diabetic subjects. Uh, furthermore, high serum vitamin E uh, levels were associated with decreased risk of type 2 uh, diabetes. At least five studies, uh, quite big studies, reported that increased consumption of vitamin E, consumption of vitamin E, is associated with decreased risk of uh, uh, the cardiovascular complications of diabetes. So it was hypothesized that vitamin E supplementation could reduce the risk of uh, cardiovascular complications of, uh, uh, of diabetes. However, the randomized controlled trials, which uh, rank as the uh, highest uh, evidence uh, studies uh, in, the, in the science world today, uh, they did not find a consistent benefit for, uh, for cardiovascular health um, for, um, uh, for this population group. Um, here you can see a, a meta-analysis showing that it was uh, no um, consistent uh, benefit uh, for vitamin E. However, and now uh, this is the exciting part, some subgroup analysis have, been, uh, has, have revealed that <coughs> uh, in certain genetic uh, makeups, vitamin E could, have, could make a difference. Um, the first study conducted in this regard, it was the uh, so-called ICAR study, um, uh, par, uh, with uh, almost uh, 1,500, uh, so 1,500 uh, uh, diabetic patients with, uh, with a so-called haptoglobin 2,2 genotype. And now 
uh, I have to introduce this term uh, to you, haptoglobin. What is haptoglobin? Haptoglobin is a protein uh, which uh, catches the free uh, hemoglobin in the blood. The free hemoglobin is known to be higher in the uh, di uh, diabetic patients and is a highly um, uh, reactive uh, um, uh, molecule. So uh, this haptoglobin protein has a gene, the HP gene, which uh, has two variants, the HP1 and the HP2 variants. Uh, diabetic individuals with uh, HP22 uh, genotype uh, has been, have been shown to have a marked increased oxidative stress and uh, also an increased risk for cardiovascular complications of diabetes. So, <clears throat> and uh, when we go back to this, uh, uh, to this eye care study, uh, in these diabetic patients with this uh, um, um, bad genotype, so to say, uh, they received uh, either placebo or 400 uh, international units of vitamin E on a daily basis. And this Kaplan-Meier plot, uh, survivor plot, uh, shows that um, the detrimental effect of, uh, of the HP22 uh, genotype has, be, have, has been uh, um, positively influenced and, and the status <coughs> has been normalized in this uh, um, sick population group with the addition of uh, vitamin E. So um, um, the uh, scientists conducted, who conducted this study uh, concluded that vitamin E supplementation at a dose of 400 milligrams reduced and also normalized the risk for cardiovascular events in diabetics. They had at that, that, uh, that time a composite endpoint of myocardial infarction, stroke, and, uh, and um, um, uh, mortality, cardiovascular mortality. <clears throat> then the next study, the so-called uh, HOPE study, um, which, were, uh, which was performed in almost 10,000 uh, people with cardiovascular disease and diabetes and other risk factors, but not with HP22, not, uh, not exclusively with HP22 uh, genotype. Uh, they administered also 400 uh, international units of vitamin E and uh, AC inhibitor or a placebo for uh, four and a half years um, and had similarly a composite endpoint. The study had no apparent effect on cardiovascular outcome per se. However, a subgroup analysis, which I, <coughs> which I mentioned previously, confirmed uh, in a post hoc uh, um, uh, calculation uh, of this uh, subgroup of uh, HP22 um, uh, participants that uh, the risk for cardiovascular events, which included uh, death and non-fatal myocardial infarction, was significantly reduced only in the diabetics carrying this harmful HP22 gene. And uh, these uh, uh, results have been um, also confirmed by, by the woman in the Women Health Study. <clears throat> um, I don't have time to go into the details. It's, it's very, uh, very interesting, however, but uh, I just would like to mention the proposed uh, function of vitamin E in this, uh, in this harmful uh, subgroup. So basically, we are talking about uh, highly reactive free hemoglobin, which is increased in, uh, in diabetic patients, and this HP22 um, uh, protein forms aggregates, which um, although um, connect to, to, uh, to hemoglobin, to this free hemoglobin, but the clearance is not that effective. And furthermore, they uh, have detrimental effects on the good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, and here uh, can a vitamin E as a powerful antioxidant come into the picture. Okay, moving to the next uh, uh, disease, uh, which is a rather a spectrum disease. It's not only one condition, it's a spectrum disease. It's called the non-alcoholic fatty liver uh, disease. Um, which uh, condition is associated with uh, certain metabolic determinants. So it's not caused by alcohol. It's uh, uh, rather linked also to diabetes or obesity and um, uh, also other uh, metabolic uh, conditions. So the story starts with fat accumulation in the liver. <clears throat> and then it can develop to so-called non-alcoholic hepatitis, which includes uh, inflammation processes and scarring in the, uh, in the liver tissue, and in certain percent, this can further develop into cirrhosis and even to liver-related death in quite a high number of, uh, uh, of cases. Why is it so important? Is it, uh, first of all, I, I would like to highlight the high prevalence in the, the modern communities. Uh, so the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease where only uh, steatosis, so only increased fat accumulation occurs, uh, it affects uh, up to 33% of the normal population. 
and um, the non-alcoholic state of hepatitis. So um, this condition with the inflammation uh, uh, aspect uh, has a prevalence up to 17%. It's also the most common cause of abnormal liver tests. And uh, maybe most importantly, uh, presently there is no approved drug for the treatment or prevention of uh, uh, non-alcoholic state of hepatitis. How does it start? There is a theory that it starts with a first, so-called first hit, a lipid accumulation, and then um, uh, oxidative stress and cytokine activation. So the inflammation process starts, and uh, it clearly shows that there is uh, more than just the peak of the iceberg in this case. This is also a busy slide. I, I'm not going into the details. I'm just uh, highlighting the different stages of the development. Everything starts with the excessive caloric intake, uh, the uh, increase the free fatty acids uh, in the <clears throat> in the fatty tissue, and uh, with this increases the lipogenesis in the and also the hepatic insulin resistance in the liver. Uh, here we are talking already uh, about the compensated uh, steatosis, which can be. Uh, uh, improved, so to say, into the uh, non, into the decompensated uh, statosis or uh, statohepatitis, where the mitochondrial beta oxidation and uh, the reactive oxygen species production is uh, much more increased, and this is already a clear uh, way into the fibrosis and uh, and cirrhosis later on. <clears throat> uh, again, vitamin E. What can we what can we do here? First, uh, just uh, have a look at this uh, these two graphs which shows the um, proportion of the normal population having steatosis, so accumulated uh, fat uh, uh, in, the, in the liver. But uh, if you uh, take into account the obese or severely obese or even the overweight population, it affects almost everybody. So <clears throat> considering that uh, in 2010 there were more than uh, one and a half billion adults uh, suffering uh, or being uh, overweight or obese, uh, the consequences are high. So uh, Arun Sanyal at uh, all published in the New England Journal of Medicine in that year, um, uh, study where uh, 400 milligrams of um, vitamin E has been administered to NASH patients uh, without diabetes. And here you can see the liver enzymes, these uh, generally accepted uh, markers of liver damage, uh, they significantly and uh, clearly um, <clears throat> went down after administering vitamin E. It was actually the same effect, very similar effect to pioglitazone, which uh, has been uh, withdrawn from the market uh, uh, in the meantime, and it was a clear difference between uh, placebo and the two treatments. Okay, what are the possible mechanisms of action in this case uh, of uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, of vitamin E? Uh, without going into the details, uh, an antioxidant properties can play a significant role, anti-inflammatory properties, uh, the metabolomics profile of these um, persons um, can also make a difference whether the person responds or not responds to the vitamin E treatment, and also the gene expression regulating role regarding PPAR gamma and other, other mechanisms can, uh, can have a, a significant influence. So as a consequence, as I mentioned, <clears throat> there is no, uh, no treatment uh, currently for, for NASH or uh, to prevent uh, uh, NASH. So therefore, the um, uh, American Gastroenterological Association concluded and published a recommendation that vitamin E uh, improves liver histology in uh, its time. Okay. Um, in, uh, in NASH uh, um, adults without uh, diabetes. Okay, this slide uh, was already mentioned by Manfred, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, um, benefits uh, in vitamin E. Uh, this is a very complicated slide again showing uh, uh, the possible mechanisms of uh, influence of vitamin E in the development of, uh, of the Alzheimer's disease. And now I would like in a one minute if I can have, thank you, uh, to link uh, uh, to our topic, what kind of role could vitamin E play in this uh, global uh, air pollution uh, issue we, we face nowadays? There is a clear link uh, showing that uh, particulate matter, so air pollution, has a, um, a link to, uh, to cardiovascular mor uh, morbidity and mortality. And I have been talking about uh, uh, this uh, uh, topic already, that vitamin E can have a beneficial uh, effect on, uh, on these parameters. Also, very briefly, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistant is also linked, uh, although these are hypotheses partly, but still the, there is a link between uh, particulate matter um, uh, pollution and um, the development of diabetes. 
uh, which includes on, uh, also oxidative stress, systemic inflammation, uh, ending up in insulin resistance. In this uh, area, vitamin E also can play a role. Again, or th uh, for a third topic, uh, uh, brain health, uh, uh, brain function and cognition. Uh, there are some theories showing that particulate matter reaches the brain, causing neuroinflammation, lipid peroxidation, DNA damage, and again, vitamin E here also can play a significant role. So uh, to sum up, uh, our intention is to, <coughs> uh, to counteract uh, the, uh, the detrimental effects of uh, air pollution by combining uh, antioxidants and polyunsaturated fatty acids to, uh, to uh, reduce the negative impact of uh, uh, particulate matter on the scientific basis, uh, of course. And this is my last, sli last slide, um, where I have uh, been, uh, I, I was curious uh, what's going on on vitamin E research nowadays, and I did a, a basic research, a basic search in the PubMed um, uh, on vitamin E and antioxidant function. Well established, more than 30,000 uh, publications, but also like prostate cancer, uh, fatty liver disease, diabetes, enormous uh, uh, number of publications with uh, connections, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer, and so on. And you see here air pollution and asthma, they are also topics uh, uh, where uh, researchers worldwide are already engaged in, and we would like to, to be <coughs> uh, here as well and um, to provide solutions for this uh, um, uh, conditions for the benefits of vitamin E, which go beyond essentiality. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you for the for the question. This is, uh, of course, uh, always uh, always a hot topic and always uh, um, a critical uh, uh, issue to discuss uh, the safety of uh, of antioxidants. Um, there are pros and and cons regarding the opinions. So uh, some some people. Um, some researchers publish, of course, uh, certain analysis, certain uh, meta-analysis of, uh, of data, existing data, and other uh, scientists uh, uh, criticize it. So um, I think that uh, it is already acknowledged also by, by the uh, uh, European Safety Authority that uh, vitamin E has a basic function, has a has a well-established antioxidant function, and there are also the upper tolerable upper limits uh, established. So um, I think uh, with this, it is well known and also accepted scientifically that uh, vitamin E uh, applied in, an, in a normal range, uh, it's, it's safe for use. May I add the following? The upper limit for vitamin E right now is 1,000 milligram a day in person. There's a recent meta-analysis, and I can share the literature with you, which is saying vitamin E up to 5,500 milligram a day in person is safe. And the American uh, Society of Nutrition has taken up this topic, and they will dedicate a workshop to this topic, vitamin E, in the next annual meeting. So please take the chance. And look at this. Maybe just another addition. Uh, it was uh, both you and, and myself uh, mentioned the Alzheimer's study. At that study, <clears throat> 2000 IU, so uh, well, uh, the double of the, uh, the top, uh, total um, upper limit, uh, tolerable upper limit, uh, has been applied without any uh, uh, adverse effects. So I think, especially in, in conditions like, uh, like Alzheimer's, where no cure is, uh, uh, is, is it's available, it must be a, a risk benefit. Uh, uh, consideration of the of the medical doctors to apply uh, antioxidants uh, or not, but uh, I think uh, a, a well conducted randomized control trial, uh, and not only one but uh, but uh, uh, a number of them uh, showed uh, no adverse effects of uh, vitamin E applied in a no normal doses. Please. So when you see, I, I see very good uh, presentation for vitamin E. Thank you. And gave a lot of new knowledge. And, but my question is, oh, what kind of vitamin E? So when you say your new funding, a new result, you say alpha vitamin E, or you say all the temper vitamin E? Like that. 
um, <clears throat> actually, it, it uh, differs which study applies which, uh, which form of, uh, of vitamin E. The RDAs, are, as I mentioned, are based on, on alpha tocopherol. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, the majority of studies, they, uh, they don't use only alpha tocopherol. They use uh, the complexity of, uh, uh, of different uh, forms, different isomers of vitamin E. Please. Thank you. Thanks for that nice presentation. Thank you. I think one of the, one of the complex, complex, complexities I always think about antioxidants is how much and when. I think, you know, the, the fact that it's either all or none is probably mistaken. We, you know, the body needs a certain amount of pre-oxidative uh, systems to occur uh, to generate actually a lot of anti-inflammatory mechanisms. So, you know, every, every single condition, different situations of aging will have different needs of antioxidant and different degrees of low, low degree of oxidative stress. So it's, it's in the, in the body, it seems to be a very, very complex and very organ-dependent phenomenon, so. Thank you for that. this. Thank you. Statement. Please, this gentleman has. Yeah, in, uh, actually, you understand the, the question I have there, because I said before, it's about the several forms or precursor of vitamin A. How is it affected by availability of these forms? Because you have to go for all, to go to, uh, to go to an old. How the availability will be different <laughs> from one form to another. That's one question. The, the second one about the, you, you have demonstrated the role of vitamin A in human health, many studies now. The question is, is it better to have it as supplement or it's naturally occurring in many plant foods? Mm -hmm. So what as? <clears throat> yeah. as Thank you very much for these two questions. The first one uh, regarding the bioavailability. We are actually engaged uh, to, to uh, investigate uh, the bioavailability of different uh, vitamin E forms and also their metabolites. It's not very much known about this, uh, this topic. So, uh, and this, uh, this leads to, to, your second, uh, um, to your second question, um, which was uh, about? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, obviously, just, just logically thinking, uh, it would be good to have uh, all the, uh, the, this RDA, these 15 milligrams uh, uh, from food, of course. But the question is, do we consume uh, five, um, uh, five uh, portion of, uh, uh, of uh, green leaf uh, vegetables per day or not? You know? And uh, there are very nice uh, studies uh, from Somosa in Vienna. She's looking at uh, what is the uh, stability of vitamin E, for example, in fish that oils which are a major source for vitamin E. Mm -hmm. And we learned out of the studies that about 60% uh, of vitamin E is degraded just in two months. So when you store your vegetable oil in your kitchen, two months uh, later, a major part of it is gone. Uh, that was a very good presentation, thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, regarding this recommended dose that you suggested, does it depend on the body weight of the person and stuff like that, or is it just on a general basis? It's, uh, it's age dependent. So, okay. uh, for example, the International uh, so, so the Institute of Medicine in the, in the United States uh, uh, states that uh, every person uh, above 14 years uh, should consume at least 15 milligrams per day. And below that, uh, there, are, uh, there are some differences, so it's less, obviously. But uh, uh, so the, it's currently, it's not, uh, not a BMI. Not very uh, fixed, uh, okay. Matched. And also one more question. In case of excess consumption, how does the body excrete or you know, uh, send out the waste? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. as you said, uh, you know, accumulation of it could be cancerous in the long run. So how does it get excreted from the system? Thank you. Um, actually, there are some, some metabolites in the, in the urine which uh, have been shown that uh, um, above a certain plasma level, uh, so the, um, the ex um, excretion of these metabolites via the urine uh, will increase. But uh, currently, we are also uh, engaged in uh, investigating this, uh, this issue.